Welcome to Capital Preview, a weekly bipartisan discussion with Iowa legislators about the key issues facing our state. Brought to you by Mediacom. Hello, I'm Bill Peard, and welcome to another edition of Capital Preview, a show that uh, profiles the senators and representatives' views on Iowa legislation at the State House. Our guest today is Senator Steve Sauters, Democrat from State Center. Welcome, Senator, and thank you for being here today. Hey, thanks for having me. Yep. So, Senator, I'm going to just jump right in because we got a, uh, a lot of important things that we want to visit about today. And the first one is the medical marijuana. And you kind of give a maybe a little background of last year and then kind of where we're at this year in the medical marijuana. Sure. Well, uh, and actually, this goes back a couple of years. If you remember <coughs> that the legislature passed, the governor signed a bill that said people with severe epilepsy could use uh, medical marijuana oil. Uh, in the treatment of. Uh, and since that time, uh, we found that uh, we, there's a loophole, which is that it's still not legal to purchase inside the, the state of Iowa. Mm -hmm. uh, and so last year, we tried to fix that by saying, uh, let's, let's put together a plan of distribution points, uh, manufacturing of the oils so that we could legally get this out to the folks that need it. Um, it is, it's passed the Senate, it's currently in the House. Um, and in, in my area, I've got uh, a couple of constituents who have actually went and talked to uh, them and their children. Uh, one uh, child is now 28 years old, uh, was eight when he, when he first started exhibiting uh, lots of epileptic seizures and having problems. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, the medication he was taking was so corrosive that it actually uh, ate away his teeth. And, he, and now he's, he, it's hard for him to eat. They had to put in a a stint into his belly to feed him because he's so afraid to eat now he, can, he <coughs> sees that as pain. Mm -hmm. Well that mother actually went ahead and is getting oil from Colorado and she says I can't wait this is I she's done the research. Um, her son Jakey went from about a hundred seizures in a three-month period to eight. I went and saw him and he was uh, where he was not he wouldn't talk to anybody and he wasn't smiling and he was kind of in his own world he was smiling, he was, he was trying to talk to me, his verbal skills uh, obviously are a little behind, but he's, he's trying, mm -hmm. and she is, she's, it's just a wonder drug uh, for her son. And I think uh, that's, that's important. We, we have to really listen to our constituents. Uh, the folks who have looked at this, uh, have tried it uh, in other states, they've, they've used it, and it really does have a positive outcome as a medical use. Uh, I've never been for legalizing marijuana mm -hmm. uh, for recreational use, mm -hmm. but it's a little, uh, I think we're a little behind the times to say it doesn't have any medical use. Mm -hmm. And so um, the other couple of things we did with that is in Iowa law, uh, marijuana is still considered a Schedule I mm -hmm. controlled substance, which means it doesn't have any medical value. Mm -hmm. um, we passed the bill out of the Senate last year, sent it to the House that says marijuana should be scheduled two, which means some medical value. And in perspective, if you add, uh, if you look at cocaine or even methamphetamine, both of those are in a schedule two because the derivatives are used in medical purposes. Right. So uh, those are just some of the things that um, we're still pushing for. Uh, mm -hmm. The Senate would be very happy if the House takes up those bills, even if they want to change them a little bit and if they come back to us. But we believe, I believe that the governor would sign uh, a bill that says we could do this in the state of Iowa. And again, Minnesota does it, Colorado does it, Illinois. There's lots of states now who have uh, already in place plans to both produce, manufacture, and distribute um, the oil to these folks. Uh, and I think our plan is pretty solid in Iowa. Do you think, um, so do you think it will come out of the House? Well, I, I you know, I've talked to a couple House. of Republican yeah. House members, uh, and um, a few of them really want it to. I know a, a few, uh, Representative Highfield is mm -hmm. is re very hard working on this issue in mm -hmm. the House, so mm -hmm. uh, I'm hopeful. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm hopeful they look at it, and I think if they talk to any of these uh, parents and and really go see some of these kids, that this stuff helps. Uh, I don't know how you can't. Yeah. I don't know how you can't say no. We're not going to help uh, Iowans who mm -hmm. are in need. Well, that's an impressive story. I cannot believe um, he had went from a hundred or roughly a hundred seizures mm -hmm. a year down to eight. I mean, that's. I mean, yeah. you're a deputy sheriff by by trade, so yeah. So we know how much you know you uphold the law and how you mm -hmm. have to evaluate this stuff. So the fact that you're behind it, I think, um, 
you know, speaks well. Well, and, and you know, it was, and I moved. Mm -hmm. I was not for it at all mm -hmm. a few years ago, but I did the research. Right. I listened to constituents, uh, and I and I believe uh, there's no no doubt that this stuff uh, does help people yep. and has some medical value. There, absolutely. Um, so why don't you talk about some of your um, your well, I got to ask one more question okay. because about this medical marijuana. So, <clears throat> as our law is written now, it can't go across borders like from Colorado to Nebraska, Nebraska to Iowa. Correct. 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 And some of that is because those states also have laws that say that they can't sell outside the outside of their borders. Okay. Part of that is because federal law has not kept up with the got state it. laws. So yep. marijuana is still illegal at the federal level, no matter what, and oils, all of it. So, um, so all that would have to change too. We need to see some change in our in the Congress. Yeah. So how does that? How does she order that by mail then? From well, the, the particular from oil that she gets does not have any THC in it. Got it. Okay. Um, and so I think uh, you know there's nothing in the oil that's necessarily regulated, and that's how she's able. To, there are different kinds. There's Got some it. with THC, okay. some without, some okay. with a mix. Uh, and so she actually gets the stuff without the THC. So does the THC have a, um, I guess, is it a stronger healing element to it? Well, or? I think it's just, it's like everything else. It yeah. all depends on how the person reacts. Okay. So there are it. some folks who, and again, this is very, very low levels of THC, right. but it's the chemical compound on how it works on a particular person. Yep. And so I think that's why there use, there's different kinds. Yeah. Um, and, and just like any doctor, you know, they might use one uh, drug on you to see if it works. It doesn't work. They try another one right. until, they, until they get the outcome that they're looking for. Right. I don't think this is any different. Boy, it sure sounds like, I mean, you know, you've done the research and you're probably more of an expert on it than I, but it sure seems like it should have a place in, you know. Uh, I believe it. In it our should. arsenal of treating people yes. like epilepsy. Let the, let the doctors do their job. Absolutely. So, Senator, I also know that you have done a bunch of um, work on judicial reform, yep. and that's probably a big part of your um, uh, this session, which you're going to be working on. So why don't you kind of go through that sure. a little bit? Well, you know, we, we did some things. We're in the second year of a two-year session. So we've done several things. One of them was to look at uh, low-level nonviolent crimes, low-level uh, possession of marijuana, for example. We had a bill last year that said small amounts of marijuana, five grams or less possession. Uh, would be moved from a serious misdemeanor to a simple misdemeanor, ticketable offense. You write them a ticket, they go see a judge, judge finds them, or they, they can take it to court if they want. Right. Um, currently, we have to arrest everybody, take them to jail, they have to get an attorney, maybe two or three months down the road, they end up pleading guilty and they pay a fine anyway. <laughs> yeah, right. But, but all those additional costs. Plus, we know that every time we put somebody in jail, even for one night, recidivism rates uh, rise. So how do we lower recidivism rates? Well, you put less people in jail at the front end and we try to get them help throughout right. the system. Yep. And so that's one of the bills that we, uh, we passed. There was another bill that looked at uh, cocaine and crack cocaine. Um, right now, crack cocaine is a more severe penalty for less weight and we're trying to move those closer together. Uh, both of the, those two bills actually have a positive minority impact in our prison system. So we're looking at those. That was actually sent to the House, and I believe that the House uh, will look at those bills. I mean, I, um, I think you have folks over there that uh, who understand that this does have a minority impact. Yeah, we can change things, and and especially when they're nonviolent crimes, right? So that's that's kind of the key when we're looking at stuff. In addition, we uh, we're looking at risk assessments. There are very good risk assessments now that can determine if a person is low risk, high need, low risk, low need, high risk, high need, all the, all the, everything in between. Uh, currently, the prison system uses that after sentencing. So a judge would sentence you to five years. You go into the prison system, and that's when they first do the risk assessment. And if you come out low risk, low need, is jail, is prison the real spot for you? Uh, I don't believe it is. I think that we have, uh, we need to do a better job of incarcerating people, uh, or at least lieu incarceration, look at uh, community programs that are cheaper on the taxpayer, but uh, have good outcomes, right? Mm -hmm. And again, we're talking about low-level people who are nonviolent. But if we can identify that prior to sentencing, or prior to the judge saying, yeah, you're going to get five years, we could actually lower the number of people going in that are low risk, high need, low risk, low need, and get them into a program in the local community. 
-hmm. and, and that helps that person. Again, remember what I said about recidivism rates. Right. Every day in jail, we raise your recidivism. So this would keep them out of the jail system. You know, we keep them out of being incarcerated and hopefully in a system that treats the problem, whether that be mental health, substance abuse, a uh, whole host of issues. It might just be that they've lived in poverty. How do we help them get a job, write a resume, interview? All of those things are gonna, are just a piece of the pie of judicial reform. Mm -hmm. um, so we're also looking at ban the box legislation and a felon rights to vote. Ban the box uh, is simply a, you put in an application and most jobs on there somewhere, it'll say, have you been arrested for a felony or other crimes? Mm -hmm. Uh, 19 other states do this. We say take that question off of the application. Now, that doesn't say that an employer can't ask the question, but, but it allows that person maybe to get to the second stage, which is a face-to-face -face interview. On the face-to-face -face interview, uh, do you have any felonies? And then that gives the chance for that person to explain, yeah, I was 19, I was doing stupid stuff, I got a felony, but I've now went to college, I have a family, Mm -hmm. You know, hopefully that'll help get that person past that first hump of just someone throwing their application in the garbage and looking at the next person. Sure. So we yeah. think that's right. a that's, that's a, good... a huge piece. Yep. Uh, felon right to vote. Uh, we've talked about this over the years. Um, I have sort of a modified idea, which is in the past, um, I think at least on my Republican colleagues said, hey, we want them to pay all their fines and everything else. Uh, on the Democratic side, we said, oh, they should, as soon as they get out of prison, they ought to be able to vote. Well, I'm looking at a, a deal where, yes, they're out, they're off paper, they've done their time, and they're caught up on payments. So they haven't fully paid off, but they're caught up. They're making monthly payments or whatever the payments are supposed to be should they get their voting rights back then. So it's kind of a hybrid, maybe. Sure. But uh, it would then allow those folks to be able to participate uh, in voting and get back in society like we want them to do, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's another Absolutely. very major piece. And then racial profiling was another piece we'll look at this year of uh, Iowa Law Enforcement Academy training, all the new recruits on racial profiling, but also trying to find a way to data collect and have an independent board look at the numbers across Iowa. And we can do this. We've got uh, a thing called tracks that we, most law enforcement use that uh, every ticket that's written, um, all those things, you can see who being arrested, um, all their background, age, uh, race, everything. And then taking a look at that across the state to see if uh, there's areas we can do better in as sure. far as racial profiling. So sure. those are all uh, pieces. And then finally, uh, probably uh, juvenile expungement of their criminal records. Uh, this is a thing that the governor spoke about in his speech it, uh, Chief Justice Katie spoke about it in his speech, and we have a bill for it, uh, Department of Corrections, I believe, or Department of Public Safety, one of the two, put together a bill for expunging juvenile records. So we're going to take a hard look at that at, in judiciary this year. Yep, that's great. Hey, um, Senator, we're kind of coming up on um, our time together sure. this morning. Um, I guess in, in a 22nd um, kind of uh, your assessment of the caucus. I mean, today it, at the time of this um, taping <laughs> is the uh, uh, Iowa caucuses tonight. So I thought maybe you want to just give a quick. Well, we, we hope that everybody that wants to participate comes out to participate. Remember that whether you're a registered Democrat or Republican, you can register at the door and you can have your voice heard at the caucuses. We want everybody that can come, come. Uh, and this is, uh, at least on the Democratic side, it's a very fun process. Yeah. It's an exciting time to be in Iowa. It is. You know, it is. If I mean, you haven't met a presidential candidate, you <laughs> haven't tried. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly <laughs> right. I, I told my, uh, my parents, I said, you know, you could be shopping in a high V, and a vice president of the United States could be in the next aisle oh, over. Absolutely. So it's it's a it's a very cool process. Well, I think things are in good hands with you, uh, Senator. I appreciate your hard work that, uh, up at the legislature. So. Um, so stay tuned for another edition of Capital Preview. Our guest today again was Senator Steve Sauters, uh, Democrat from State Center. Thank you.